And welcome back to the Wilburn Auditorium here on the campus of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy in Malibu, California. I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate Policy School, and we are about to begin our fourth and final session in this short course, The Roots of Capitalism versus Socialism, a Conversation. In our first seminar, we explored the importance of the term political economy and why these two words, often segmented and separated, really need to be seen together and in tension. We then went on to look at two primary thinkers, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In our second session, we looked at the work of Adam Smith, often seen as the father of capitalism. We then set him in conversation with Karl Marx in our third session. We now look at all of these thinkers and concepts and philosophies in light of the American project. To do that, once again, we'll be in conversation ourselves with our Dachshund Professor Emeritus, Dr. Gordon Lloyd. Through it all, we'll again be uh, citing quotations from uh, the book Dr. Lloyd has co-written, Liberty and Equality in Political Economy. In today's session, we'll be exploring these concepts in light of four major areas. First, the American founding, then the progressive movement, on to the New Deal, and we'll conclude today's session with a look at the Reagan Revolution. Who better then to begin this conversation once again by joining us here, Dr. Gordon Lloyd. Dr. Lloyd. Thank you, sir. Pleased to be here. Well, Dr. Lloyd, we've really spanned the globe in the three conversations leading up to this fourth session. Uh, but we've spent most all of our time in Europe, and now we're going to begin to explore the impact of these conversations and principles uh, here on the American Project, beginning with the founding. I wanted to set the stage for the discussion uh, going back to your book, Liberty and Equality. Quote a passage and, and get your thoughts. Uh, this is page 121, in which you talk about the difference between the equality narrative and the liberty narrative. You write, and I quote, Crucial to the equality narrative is the belief that there must be one all-encompassing collective whole in order to eliminate conflict. That is why even workers' cooperatives in either Fortier's or Mill's sense were to Marx and Engels an unacceptable economic compromise because those cooperatives still would compete with one another in the market. Crucial to the liberty narrative is the belief that conflict, or faction in Madison's sense, cannot be eliminated and therefore, the object of government and the rule of law is to manage or minimize conflict. So let's look at the American founding, Madison, Jefferson, others, in their view, looking at the importance, if not the inherent nature, of conflict or competition in the natural senses of mankind and how they created a economic and political system to respond to that. <clears throat> yes, and part, part, part of the difficulty of answering this is that to, to, to refer to uh, a word, you know, a phrase that you mentioned you know, in, earlier in our conversations, is sort of where is the beginning where do, you, where do you start from? And that is a huge bit, issue in, in American scholarship and American life, and it's still very big. That is where you, the American story of certain, in a certain way unfolds from its, from, from its origin. So when did it begin? Uh, you could say how it's in it's with the arrival of Columbus. So the new world mm. is f far from being Oh, a brand new world. Let's go explore a, a new life free from Europe. It becomes that Columbus arrived and killed everybody, he gave them disease. So, I mean, that becomes the American story after that. It's, it's, yeah. it, if you begin with 1492 and you begin with that, it's not going to be a happy story. 
It's going to be a grim one. And then there's another story, 1619, which right with the first slave that arrived. And therefore, the story is not going to be a happy one. Ever, otherwise, I mean, down the line, unless you start saying well, this, this, this slaves actually got themselves free. And yeah, but it, it's not going to be a new world with new options uh, once you get slavery in there. And then you got the 1620 narrative, mm -hmm. the, the Mayflower Compact. And so the story of America is contracts, compacts, freely made by people and signed. Mm -hmm. And then you've got that whole colonial history dealing with contracts and et cetera, and, and compacts, and they get to the revolution, 1776. So 1776, as Tocqueville would say, sort of the fulfillment of a narrative which began in the cradle with 1620. And so it came out of the townships and across the land. And there are others who say the American story begins with 1776. Prior to that, there was no story. It was all about empire. And so therefore, 1776 marks a revolution, mm -hmm. a freeing from certain notions. So to, to answer your question, it's extremely difficult unless we somehow start with where does the American story begin? Because it has a huge impact, as you have pointed out in our earlier conversations, on where we go. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, for our purposes, uh, I, I would say let's begin with 1776 because it, begin, it helps us do Locke mm -hmm. and it helps us, do, uh, helps us do Adam Smith and bring in that story. It's not to deny that there was politics and economics and et cetera, and religion before, but in order to, to <laughs> break this down into the, our, our, the time that we have, Let's begin with 1776. <clears throat> well, what's Lockean about that? Contract. That government, legitimate government, is only founded by the consent of the governed, and the purpose of government is to secure rights, life, liberty, and, and the pursuit of happiness, and, and uh, in, in, the, um, in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which Jefferson also wrote, which he wrote one month prior to the Declaration of Independence, it has life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness and property. And so a lot of people have made an issue out of the absence of the right to property in the Declaration of Independence and what is the impact for the economic and political system because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I would say that, for, for, for unfortunately, Jeff said said these rights, among which are, I mean, would it taken him that much more time to put on property and <laughs> stop this whole argument about that the Declaration deliberately omits property? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that, that's that, that that's where we we begin, and I think it has a Lockean uh, basis, but it also has an American basis. Mm. That is, it brings the story of the colonial times in, but it, but it has a this this shall we say Lockean base of consent. And so you start off with presuming that all men are created equal, which is a huge, I mean, what does that mean? I look around me and I don't see that somebody is equal to me. It, if you put it in Lockean words, it means that I am, you're not born to rule and inherit ruling from, from your daddy and your mummy that it want to. Um, and I'm not born to be your serf. Mm -hmm. so, there's a, so that in a sense, the bonds of monarchy, the bonds of aristocracy are broken. Mm -hmm. And the cases that so monarchy and, and, uh, and serfs are unnatural. Mm -hmm. so, it, okay, so where do we go from here? But I think that's important because one of the first things that Jefferson did in Virginia was to abandon primogeniture by the first point. So that mm -hmm. changes the whole idea of property. In the Northwest Ordinance, it begins, I mean, we, it ends with the famous, say, no slavery shall be in the Northwest. That, that was 1787. But it begins with saying no primogenitor. So I think that the Northwest Ordinance is an attempt to, is an attempt to outline in American terms, Lockean terms, that uh, this new land beyond the 13 colonies is going to be of a certain nature. Because slavery is, a, is actually, in my opinion, a, a, a sort of a, a, 
uh, transportation to the new world of an old idea of serfdom. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, it's not just Lincoln who asked it, but he asked it very fervently, mm -hmm. is that can you have a commercial society in which you also have serfdom mm -hmm. in a form of slavery? Right. And so in from the very beginning, you've got this north-south issue and how and 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 so that leads to well do the did the founders put slavery in the course of ultimate extinction how could they do it this kind of stuff and it, it, also history is full of all, of all of that i my opinion in, in terms of our conversation is that the, the idea was planted that we were responsible for our own life liberty and the pursuit of heaven and it was from god it was from nature and that the purpose of government was to protect those rights. I mean, that becomes the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And I think when 1787 comes around, there's the notion that the protection of those rights at the state level were unevenly, uh, so something had to be done mm -hmm. to protect those rights. And so you have a debate, an American conversation over well, what kind of structure do we create to secure rights when you've got this localism, which they're used to, people are used to. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the, the presence of, perhaps the revolution has failed, and mm -hmm. you have the, 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 the haunting specter of Europe, as you're saying, mm -hmm. and, which comes in 1789, mm -hmm. and the 1790s with the reign of terror and everything. That's what happens after a revolution. So you've got the Chase Rebellion, you've got various things going on. And I think that what the Constitution Convention attempts to do is to secure a structural arrangement, which is an improvement on these Articles of Confederation and the state constitution, uh, improve on the structure without losing the purpose. And the purpose is to secure rights. Um, I mean, we could go on and talk about, we, I, so, you know, what I could say is that the, you know, one question is, to what extent then does the Constitution imply or de de definitively secure a certain kind of e e economy? Yeah, so I, I think what is interesting is this view of competition is one that cuts across political economy both politics and economics. And certainly in the view of the founders, there was a necessity to not only create a government system that facilitated commerce, but the competition that we saw in commerce needs to be understood and considered in politics as well. I wanted to read this one paragraph from Liberty and Equality, page 49, and get your thoughts. Quote, this leads us to emphasize what is critical in the origin and development of the commercial republic. Commerce is vital for the preservation of economic, political, and religious liberty. At the heart of commerce is not only the idea of trade and exchange, but also competition. It is through the competition of firms and industries for the support of the consumer that economic liberty is secured. Similarly, the competition of the separate branches of government and different levels of government, augmented by frequent and fair elections, help secure political freedom. Linked to this is the notion that religious liberty is strongly influenced by the competition between a vast number and variety of religious sects for the support of the quote-unquote religious consumer. So it could be seen that you have these very fractious materials here in these spheres of government, commerce, and religion. But rather than trying to squelch those, Madison and the founders really seek to create a system that understands, considers those, but seeks to harness them in a way that creates a flourishing society. This is borrowed from Smith, but it is, um, shall we say, planted in a, in a and, but it was not planted easily because you have an opposition to that. Uh, one opposition is that how can, that commerce and republic don't go together. That's, a, that's just a, an absurd because republics were used to being small mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. being homogeneous, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and commerce undermines that. It, it's, commerce is very revolutionary. Mark, it's just Mark, not only Marx that recognized the revolutionary character of capitalism and commerce, but the founders understood it, particularly the group known as the Anti-Federalists, who I, I think should be called sort of anti-big government. Mm-hmm. So they saw government as a problem. And, and, and so say both sides agreed that liberty should be preserved. But the question is, where is liberty, where is the danger to liberty? And the danger to liberty from, from uh, say, Madison is the breakdown of of, of, um, of, 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 of the role of government and the, and the breakdown that occurs through faction. And so what you need to do is to create a system whereby, whereby one group competes with another group so that the outcome, by an invisible hand, the outcome is, is consistent with some idea of the public good. So you don't approach the public good as the public good and then impose it. But somehow the public good emerges out of this exchange and competition. And, and the, it, he says in Federalist 51, it's highly unlikely that a, a coalition created by such competition would, would lead to an undermining of the public good. So there's a faith in competition as a substitute for war. So competition is not war, and it's not even war by another means. Mm. If, if you, here's a platform that you can engage in commerce, the commerce of religion, is that's very mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. That, um, that like Smith laid that down as one of the functions of government is to foster mm-hmm. a competition between religions and to make sure that one religion does not dominate the, the the political arena, so that so then you have the question: Well, what are, what is this separation of church and state, and separation of church and commerce, and the competition? I mean, it takes a while to work that one all that one out mm-hmm. uh, because there is still a very strong shall say, attachment to. I mean, in the, in the state constitution, you have to take an oath to to believe in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And, and that, is, that is separated out in the Constitution. There's no religious test for office. That doesn't mean the same becomes an atheistic document. Not at all. But it, it becomes now part of the cultural infrastructure that, that, you, that you talk about. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be part of a, an expression of who we are as a state, that we have a state religion. I mean, that's very British. It's very Lutheran in, in, in Germany, and, and Marx, Marx's parents had to meet that because uh, it, it, they were um, from a long rabbinical tradition, mm-hmm. and their name was Mordecai. Mm-hmm. And the, the answer for, from the state with 1815 Prussia was you either become non-Jewish mm-hmm. or you lose your job. Mm-hmm. And so it, Mordecai became Marx. Mm-hmm. So... I, and then Marx was, 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 kept going about this religious question of what do you do about the Jews? And one answer is the American solution is don't make it matter. Mm-hmm. It's a private thing. It's your own private property. And so I think that idea of competition is not to encourage war, but to offer choice. Now, to be clear, what the founders weren't saying necessarily that religion was purely a private matter, but that it would not be determined by the state. Uh, still something important for the public square uh, and something in which that could be seen as flourishing within this competitive system, but also something that was very important to creating a culture to support this competitive system. It, 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 that's correct. It should not be a state question. We should not be talking about the establishment of religion, as we have a Church of England, a Church of, of, of uh, Germany, and that, that becomes an important entry into commercial life or political life. So that, for Madison, the most important right of all was the right to conscience. 
which meant that you could worship God as, as, as you see. It's not, it's not a right from religion, it's a right of religion. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's no establishment. That doesn't mean to say doing away with it. It, right. means, that, it means that you, in a sense, make it communal, make it private, and make it your choice. So again, we're, we're to this discussion around something that is counterintuitive, this understanding that in these spheres of religion, politics, and economics, that they are fractious in their nature, but rather than seeking to overly control these that we would see in Marx, certainly, what the founders understood is they need to be supported, yes, regulated to a degree, but within their own spheres allowed to compete. That would be their, I think that would certainly be Madison's argument, the, the, uh, the argument that was persuasive at the founding, but there have been, uh, there's this alternative tradition which keeps suggesting that it's too individualistic, that it is not sufficiently community-minded, that it limits the role to government to just simply uh, uh, making sure that commerce and everybody else is, 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 is behaving themselves and punish the naughty, but not get involved in making people good. And it's certainly not an example of, of what we could call traditional communitarianism. It is not, yeah, it's not a, but at the same time, it's not an idea of, of government is there to do some good. I, I mean, to do good, that because the private sector can't generate it. But of interest, we still saw the communitarian impulse here in America, right? We think of Tocqueville coming to the United States, 50 years after the founding, 50 years after all these systems are put in place with competition among all these spheres, yet he still sees this communitarian impulse, the importance of civil society along with government in solving and responding to local and state and regional problems in America. That's right, well, the, the, uh, but, uh, but associations compete with each other. Mm-hmm. So you don't have just one association. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, association for professional this, that, and the other. Prof- so association for aviation this, and association for such and such. And I think Madison's model is, is that through this multiplicity of interests, mm. invisible hand, a multiplicity of interests, um, competing, colliding, colluding, that, that it, you can't help but get uh, some very close approximation to justice, the public good, and what's good, and the well-being, and 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 without losing liberty. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you go back to Plato and the idea of the perfect regime, commerce does not play a part. Commerce is going to the lower class, who just provide the shoes, etc., for the upper class. They don't have. A, I mean, they're they're bronze. Right. There's no upward mobility. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, because the platonic system doesn't fail. And then, then you have the warriors, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so the, the, this education system sifts people, sifts people out by some prior method, and commerce doesn't play a big part in this, nor does liberty. Hmm. There is, uh, there is I mean, it's the good, and who knows the good? Good is that's the philosophers know the good. And so they, I mean, well, how do they know it? Uh, by by their ability to turn themselves around and escape the cave of shadows mm-hmm. in which the rest of us live. But there's no idea that, well, this is what you think of as the good, this is what you think is the good, this is what, no, there's a good. Now, bringing, having a multiplicity of goods can, be, can become just the worst. That is, it's just your good, not my good. So can you please express your truth? Because there is no truth. I mean, that's the danger right. of, of, of saying there is no one good. So it could become loose. But I think Madison's point is that there is a good, but it emerges from this competition. Right. So there's a faith in the competitive nature, which will calm down the idea of faction. Mm. So that we replace faction with competition. And because if you ask Marx, there's a, there are two classes, right? the class in power and the class out yep. of power. Right. That's politics, Yes. right? Mm-hmm. That's faction. Mm-hmm. I don't like you. 
I'm going to do everything I can to extract surplus labor from you. Or, you know, I'll do everything I can to cut a minute here and cut a minute on a, on a tea break mm-hmm. or something. So there's always that sneakiness. And this, mm-hmm. I think what, what, what Madison is saying is that there are a multiplicity of interests um, that exist in a civilized society. I mm-hmm. mean, that's Adam Smith. Mm-hmm. There's a civilized society, there's an uncivilized society. Mm-hmm. It's not two classes. It could become two classes if we're not careful. Mm-hmm. But that, what that does, means that we're going to have class war. Why don't we have interest war? Interest is, sorry, uh, um, collision. Mm-hmm. And, that, what the, and so there's, again, an invisible hand, but his point would be that it's through the multiplicity that we secure freedom. Because he raises the question, but is it possible? Let's just say Plato's Republic mm-hmm. is is possible. I mean, what happens in Plato's Republic is the last book, everything collapses. Yes, right, and and, and, and so you get dictatorship. Mm-hmm. So keep a republic if you can keep, keep it. it. Frankly, you could ask Plato. Plato right? couldn't do it. Yeah, Plato couldn't do it. Even him, even Socrates was king. <laughs> it would fall apart. It wouldn't survive after Socrates, which then becomes, what do you do after the king or the philosopher dies? I mean, that is the European problem. Mm-hmm. What do you do next? Mm-hmm. And the American answer is you have an election. Mm-hmm. We don't have to have that in, 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 inheritance in that way. We have inherent rights rather than inheritance so that we can appeal to our nature. And, and Madison's point is, look, even if Plato's Republic were possible, you know, how, do you, how do you survive Socrates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it would mean liberty would be lost. And the whole American experiment is to preserve and secure the blessings of liberty. And so again, as we look at government systems and politics, when we think about the founding, it was for Madison and the founders the importance again of competition within political systems. So we certainly see that for Madison, not only within the federal government where we have the separation of powers, the different branches, but we also see that at levels of government between federal government and state governments. We see that then at the next level between state governments and local governments. And then we even see that again between local governments and broader civil society, the opportunity to ask the question, is this even government's role to respond to? Talk about the importance of competition within the creation of this very diverse governing system. Yeah, I think that that if we look at what they're trying to replace, and at the same time, uh, reflect on what has happened between 1776 and 1787 at, in, within the American experiment, mm-hmm. we will get at least a clue mm-hmm. to answer your question. What I think makes America different, at least in their, in their self-understanding, is monarchy of religion, monarchy of politics, and monarchy of commerce is not, does not produce the well-being for the meanest lot. Mm-hmm. All it does is to produce a centralization of power. And, and so there's a fight against monopoly in all three uh, areas. Mm-hmm. And so it's a kind of a strange thing that these colonies get together for the, really the first time and become a cooperative coalition and they decide that what they need is competition <laughs> that we don't need i mean so for example the declaration says it's the right of the people to choose the form of government under which they live that's a clear understanding that monarchy is out and you could say well they could choose monarchy then not one of the 13 states chose monarchy mm. and, and then when you get to the constitution you, i mean i've been asked uh, I remember giving a lecture and the question, can you tell me ex- in, in such a simple words, how do you know that, um, that the Constitution is a republic? And I said, well, it's, 
I like more than a few words, but since you restrict me, um, I will say that no titles of nobility hmm. and frequent elections. Mm -hmm. And then we can go from there. Mm -hmm. A frequent election means there's going to be competition. Hmm. And no titles of nobility means there's going to be competition for esteem and excellence. It's not granted by a monopolistic agency, mm -hmm. but it is, um, we're not doing away with honor. We're not doing away with um, rewards, uh, but it's achieved differently. I mean, we play around with you know, Medal of Freedom, such and such and such, mm -hmm. and such. But, mm -hmm. it's, but it's an elected official rather than an inherited. So yeah, I like to play around with the idea as we go along. Difference between inherent rights and inherited rights. Mm -hmm. Inherent rights comes from nature, and somehow the founders tradition is liberty is natural to human beings. But so too, because of liberty, the possibility exists that war, a state of, that a state of liberty could become a state of war. Mm -hmm. So how do we have liberty and order? Mm. Right. So why, why do we have to give up liberty in order to have order? And why do we have to give up order in order to have liberty? So competition brings order. I know it's kind of counterintuitive. Very good. But it, it's the, the way in which you get order is by not having one branch monopolize at either the state level, the county level, et cetera. That requires certain competition, but it requires cooperation. Mm between the branches, between, between the state and the county. And sometimes you see the cooperation breaking down even within the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you, you're, so I mean, faction is sown in the nature of man. I think, in a, in a sense, for, for, for Madison, faction is sown in the nature of man, period. I think that what Marx would say is faction is sown in the nature of capitalistic man. Mm. And if we could get, if we could just control the capitalistic part, then we will have a new man, mm -hmm. capital M. We'll have a new, new way of thinking. And I think Madison is saying that is a long stretch, <laughs> right? <laughs> if, if, if not even impossible. Right. We've never seen it. Never seen it. So that's it. Certainly, if that is good, that, but what we have seen is war over certain, uh, certain things. War over property, uh, war over religion, mm -hmm. and war over politics. So how do we come to grips with that? You cannot, look, we want to create a constitution which will endure into remote futurity. I mean, that itself is, is, is a huge task because no regime in the history of the world up to 1776 had existed forever, mm. even Rome. Mm. And, and I can remember b b being brought up to, like, like you were, so they had a certain British uh, quality to it. And my understanding was the British Empire would never end. It's, there's, every time you put your foot, there's another, there's another red spot. Not mm -hmm. red spot means a pink spot, it means Britain. Mm -hmm. The British Empire is gone, right? And that is within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Nothing would put an end to the Russian Empire. Right. I mean, that was the whole promise. I mean, you talk about the utopia. The promise is that this is going to last forever, or everything's going to be all right during your lifetime. And after Lenin and Stalin, which was no exactly uh, uh, you know, fishing in the morning. and <laughs> We've yet to see that. We've yet to see that. <laughs> but what we have seen is, uh, is it's collapsed. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're trying to revive it, mm. right? But no regime has, uh, has lasted forever. No, 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 no empire mm -hmm. has lasted forever. What makes us think then that we are going to create a republic which is fragile in and of itself by adding commerce, which somehow inherently seems to be anti-republican. Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't encourage complete old-fashioned Republican virtues, mm -hmm. because it includes making money off of money, mm -hmm. which is not an old-fashioned Republican virtue. Mm -hmm. So you have to invent bourgeois virtues, 
or commercial virtues. And those are the things that Tocqueville loves that has been created. He says, in one part, self-interest rightly understood. Mm. He says, the American regime is, is not going to create great artists, great p- paintings, mm-hmm. great you know, he, yeah. uh, poets, etc. But it is going to create an orderly, regular, decent, sensible community that arrives on time, has manners, <laughs> you know, takes care of their family, goes mm-hmm. to church, etc. What's so bad about that? Mm. And the answer is, it's not Rome. Mm. It's not Athens. It's not, where's the greatness? Mm. This is just simply mediocrity. Mm. But you see, but it, it, but it, it is made for most of us. Yes. Well, most of us come from mediocre means. <laughs> and so the promise is leave your old land and come here mm-hmm. and have a fresh start. Mm-hmm. And a fresh start will involve taking care of yourself, plowing the land, doing such and such. Thing. The Lockean mm-hmm. kind of model. Mm-hmm. Um, so commerce is... I mean, I think we've gone away from your question, but I think that it's... Uh, the, the, I think the important point here is that for both Smith and Marx, the discovery of America is extremely important because it presents the opportunity of a new world. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and, and for if you ask Smith, um, what, what two discoveries or one, say one discovery which you think has really changed the world and make, uh, make, make it possible for us to live a different life? Mm-hmm. That we have mm-hmm. instead of the the old Solomon Grundy born on Monday, mm-hmm. uh, married on Tuesday, <laughs> not divorced, but <laughs> fell sick on on Wednesday, yeah. got worse on Thursday, died on Friday, buried on Saturday. That's the life of Solomon Grundy. Mm-hmm. That old uh, that old nursery rhyme kind of thing. Well, can we have a life without Solomon Grundy? Mm-hmm. Can we improve the human condition? Mm-hmm. What does it take to improve the human condition? Well, you've got to have to drop Monopoly. Mm-hmm. But that hasn't worked. In all spaces. In all spaces. Right. So I know that we're trying to compress a lot into a fairly short amount of time, especially as it relates to American political and economic history. But I do want to jump ahead now, about a century, uh, to the next really significant set of questions around the role of competition, the role of government, the role of economics. And that's the progressive area, looking somewhere around the 1860s, 1870s, through, I guess you would say, around World War I. Yeah, I think you can almost go to World War, uh, the end of World War I. World War I, there's a a sort of uh, a a temporary ending or a temporary stop to, to uh, to the hopes of, of, of the progressives, and yes, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, that, that, that's a broadly understood that period. Major thinkers at the time were talking Herbert Crowley, uh, yeah. Frederick Jackson Turner, yes. Charles Beard. Yes. So to set the stage then for this era, I, w- I wanted to go back to your book again. This is one, page 127, where you describe in this paragraph, some of the interests and goals of the progressives, and I want to be clear, this is the progressive movement of the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, Here you write, and I quote, the third common dimension to the progressives is their belief that cooperation among the various elements in society should replace competition among these elements. There is something both inefficient and unseemly about the competitive markets. The progressives were not particularly opposed, for example, to monopolies because there was a certain advantage in terms of economies of scale as as well as a greater ease in forming a cooperative approach toward the common good between a monopoly in economics and a monopoly in government. And this is particularly true if politics becomes administration, and the locus of government shifts from self-serving special interest in the legislature to public-serving certified experts in the administrative state. The progressive's correction of the equality narrative is to introduce the regulatory state 
to the American scene. So again, we, we are looking at these issues of competition and cooperation. Tell us about how the progressive movement understood that and what they were responding to in that time. Well, uh, to use your earlier phrase, I mean, what is the context? It's very important. I think th their, their claim is that we're living in a new era, that we're now living in the industrial age. The industrial age arrived in, in, arrived in America, that before that, America was an agrarian country, which is a bit of a stretch because uh, the whole idea of the Federalist is, is, is actually creating or presupposing a commercial society. Mm -hmm. And in fact, agriculture was commercial. Just because you say this is an ag agriculture base doesn't mean to say you've done away with competition or commerce or mm -hmm. trading. Or the sciences. All the, all the sciences and the arts and sciences of plowing well mm -hmm. and managing your fields and everything like that. So I think it's a bit of an error to see it as, I mean, it's a bit of a sort of a soft, soft Marxism to say that you, know, you go from feudal society to uh, capitalist society, but a lot of these people say we're, we're living in an agrarian society with this philosopher Jefferson and his travel, fellow traveler Madison. And, but now we're in a new world. Mm. Now we have uh, slaughterhouses and something has to be taken about slaughterhouses. Um, is it going to be state regulation? Then we got this problem. Is mm -hmm. it state regulation? Is it federal regulation? What are we going to regulate? Where does the courts fit into the, all of this? I mean, that's a huge history of the three, the three branches competing with each other, and uh, and coming up with different coming up with different answers. And so I think the first point is that they progressives think that we're living in a new world, and that constitutions are somehow matched with the agrarian I mean, uh, or time in which you do it. Mm -hmm. So that, again, that's very, very, very soft sort of Marxist framework. It's not Marxism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really want to make that point. Mm -hmm. but, but, the, but the idea is that constitutions are a reflection of the time in which you live. Mm -hmm. So now we have a different time in which we live, mm -hmm. but we have the same constitution. So it's time to change the Constitution. Well, what is it about the current Constitution, both the, 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 say, say the general level and the state level, what is it about the, those Constitutions which, which we want to address? Right. The idea of the, the legislative branch, which I think for the first, say 60 years from the founding, the legislative branch was the important branch. Mm -hmm. Senate was the debating society, et cetera. And the executive carried out functions. They had some independence, but it was not, politics did not revolve around mandates from the people to the executive to be, to be implemented. The legislative branch where conversations could take place over big issues. So you had a competition, mm -hmm. right? Well, that must go. Mm -hmm. So uh, the state legislatures became a, a target. And what uh, one target was for, to remove their ability to elect U.S. senators, mm -hmm. 17th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Another target was to give the federal the general government the power over taxation, right, which is the 16th Amendment. Mm -hmm. now, now you're getting the progressive amendments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The, the 18th Amendment was to, was to provide fried for the general government to control um, uh, intoxicating, intoxicating liquors, liquors right? Mm -hmm. uh, which meant it take it out of the state hands. So you now it's centralized. Um, and, and then the, 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 right, the right of women, for where certain states had, had given that right. Now you're taking it out of the hands of the state legislatures and you're putting uh, the, these decisions in the hands of essentially the executive branch or the governor's branch. So instead of deliberation, you want action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, Dr. Lloyd, I wanted to go back to the, a, a couple terms that uh, I quoted before in that paragraph because I, I want to get a sense of how the progressives were, were seeing what they were responding to. You use two 
um, words here that I wanted to get your thoughts on. In particular, you said there was something both inefficient and unseemly about competitive markets. Again, whether in economics or in politics. The words inefficient and unseemly. How were, how were the progressives understanding those terms and how were they finding ways to respond to them? There's something among, let's just say, European intellectuals, and I'm speaking very, very broadly, very, very generally, there's something about the American experiment which just seems to be not quite up to snuff. I mean, where is the great art? Where mm -hmm. is the, it's the ordinary person, tobacco chewing, right? <laughs> Strange accents, all this kind of stuff. But it's a place that ordinary people want to go mm -hmm. in Europe. They want to flee to this. But what has America produced? Uh, where's America's Mozart? Mm. Where's it? So there's a certain intellectual pomposity or intellectual gravitas which looks at America as a strange place full of ordinary people doing ordinary things. What's the fuss about? <laughs> So there's something unseemly mm. about making a defense and making a way of life out of making money off of money and trading and commerce and, and, and sort of dealing with wildfires and taking up a pioneer and going mm -hmm. west and doing all of that. Well, that might be good for kids, but I mean, for, for, serious, for serious people, I mean, that is, you, you're discovering things. But we, so there's something just not quite up to, up to snuff. Mm -hmm. so there's a certain European arrogance. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in early American education, and I would like to get to education as an, an important element in saving a republic. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the early uh, uh, days, there was a certain idea of where should you tell, send your children to school? So that you get people like Franklin and, and, and Washington and Jefferson, and, and now they're, they're no, I mean, they're not part of the, right, the proletariat, mm -hmm. but they're part of an, an American bourgeois or whatever it is, and they're an elite that somehow justify that they've come up by themselves. They well, where do you send your children to school? And a lot, and Franklin, for example, says you don't send your children to school in Europe. Because mm. what they'll learn is how to bend their knee mm. to a nobleman or a monarch. And then they'll come back, and they won't be American anymore. Mm. So there's something about America, which no titles of nobility, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you send your child, child to Europe for an education, you are, uh, <laughs> don't expect that person to come back the same. The difference between subjects and citizens. That's it. So you need an education in citizenship. Mm. You don't need an education education and being, being a subject. Mm. But that's what they're going to get. They're not going to get citizenship. Mm -hmm. And if they go to France for an education, they're going to get an education in terror. <laughs> well, I just made that up. But, 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 you could, but you could, even Jefferson realized that mm. that kind of dropping of blood was a bit much. And so as we, we look at politics then, there is this introduction, as you write, about the unbiased disinterested expert and this is someone who's going to work out these issues of competition there won't be competition once you have a disinterested expert talk about the role of expertise in government as the progressives introduce this term that's right let's deal with the inefficiency right yeah one of the claims of those who love the market is that the market produces efficient outcomes that you're using, the, using labor and capital in the most efficient way because a capitalist wouldn't use it inefficiently, otherwise they'd lose money, they'll go out of business. So part of the competitive spirit is to produce efficient. Mm -hmm. All right. But the progressives would look, I'll say, put this market failure. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore we have an inefficient use of resources. Booms and busts. Booms and busts, that's right. <coughs> And also, the, 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 and this is the early stages, the, the producing of absolutely useless things, mm -hmm. which reaches its pinnacle like in the 1950s, where Kenneth, John Kenneth Galbraith talks about fin, fin tails on, on Chevys. 
Why do you need a fintech? Why do you need all of that kind of stuff? It's not, it's not excessive. Mm. So it becomes inefficient use of resources. Now, that should appeal to a capitalist mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and appeal to a public that has been brought up on efficiency. Mm-hmm. So I think that's part of the efficiency argument that capitalists, capitalists, A, they have booms and busts. The capitalism doesn't produce outcomes in the intended, and they produce some kind of useless things that we could well use our productive forces in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that capitalists are only interested in making profit, and they're not very good at that either. Mm. So now what we need, we don't, we don't need to manage this economy. So you have, what you have now is the origin of planning. Mm-hmm. In a very sort of, I mean, it reaches, it reaches this huge element in, L, uh, in FDR and the New Deal with planning, and then LBJ with planning. And the Reagan revolution, I think, is to try to remove that whole emphasis. And we'll get to Reagan at the end. I understand, but I'm trying to to show the the progress of the progressives, Mm -hmm. say, why, why, and and the, uh, shall we say, the persistence, nevertheless, that that capitalism is a failure, how how persistent capitalism isn't surviving. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if you take a look at that 16th Amendment, it only lasted 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then it was returned to the states Mm -hmm. to do. So those, I mean, those, what did they do? It ended up producing an underground economy. It didn't do away with commerce in liquor. Mm-hmm. It encouraged a different kind of commerce, underground commerce, which you can't tax. Right. And then it becomes illegal. And Hoover, mm-hmm. although Hoover's understanding was, this is a very noble experiment that America is engaged in. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the, the, the temperance movement was sort of a continuation, which is progressive, mm-hmm. the continuation of the abolitionist movement. Mm-hmm. But now we've done away with human slavery. We have to deal, do away with the, with the sin of, of drink. Mm-hmm. And now in the progressive era, what you have with manufacturers coming up, et cetera, you have people going to work and then aren't stopping off on a pub on the way back. Mm-hmm. Or they get paid on a Friday, and by the time they get home, they've spent all their money, and there's a lot of abuse through alcohol, etc. So let's solve the problem. Let's, mm-hmm. em- let's remove mm-hmm. the temptation. The temptation. So if you remove the temptation, then we will have, um, but we don't have liberty anymore. Mm. So, so that, that, that's, part, that's part of the problem. You don't have liberty. So, but you do, so, but you have to do it underground. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to come after you, mm-hmm. right? And one of the interesting things is, is that the language, it doesn't say alcohol in the 16th Amendment. It says uh, intoxicating liquor. liquor. So I mean, what is an intoxicating liquor? Something that makes me intoxicated? Or is it something in the liquor itself that is intoxicating? And when do you become intoxicated? You open the administrative state. Who's going to decide those questions? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, not the state legislature. Right. You, you don't want that, right? So you have to have some administrator who deals with the Department of Intoxication. <laughs> but Congress is going to get in the way. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to have to have what happens to conscience, what happens to religion. Mm-hmm. The answer is knock, knock on the door. I believe in the sacrament. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to have, you know, Joe's uh, c- 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 colored cola for, for my sacrament. <laughs> I'm going to eat drink the body, I'm going to eat the body and drink the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. That means drinking wine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So s- sacramental wine was not considered to be intoxicating liquor. Mm-hmm. So there's a competitiveness mm-hmm. which is still there in the American spirit despite the attempt to control, eliminate. And I think the lesson that was learned was even though it was a noble idea, it's an idea that shouldn't be put into practice because, because of all the disorder. Mm-hmm. So you don't have anything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that was just before Roosevelt came in, they had an amendment uh, on doing that. But I think that's a, that the whole liquor story is an extremely important part of the role of the central, the mm-hmm. role of the state, the role of the counties, uh, and the way commerce fits in and how it fits in. Or what, I mean, that's an attempt to remove, to change us from a commercial republic. Right, and civil society as well. There were temperance societies all along the way leading up to official kind of government engagement in that. So very, you're right, that is a, a very interesting part of American history and this story. 
Yeah, also, part of the progressive, what we think are the progressive, is the government agents. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of progressive thinking people who created associations and civil societies. Like, for example, because uh, women were being battered. You get women's homes being created. Mm -hmm. You didn't need a government agency. Mm -hmm. Americans created their own mm -hmm. safe houses. You have Hull House? Yeah, yeah exactly. Jane way, Adams? And, and I think one of the progressives' idea was if it worked so well voluntarily, then we should make it work ex precisely and forever. Because when, once you volunteer, you can unvolunteer. Yes. And so the idea then goes away. So let's, let's make this efficient. Let's make this proper. Let's make this government policy. Policy for every, so if it's good enough voluntarily, it's good enough for, for us. So once again, time is, is very short to, to take in a lot of history here, but I wanna see if we can move now, and this is a good transition point, to looking at the move from the progressives into the New Deal era. Obviously, we have the Great Depression, mediating, if you will, this transition. But talk a bit about Herbert Hoover, the transition to FDR. It's something you've written about before in a book you called The Two Faces of Liberalism. Talk about this transition and how in many ways the New Deal was another step along the way in the creation of the disinterested state. Let me start off with the, with the word laissez-faire. French word means, to, depending on how you translate it, means to, to, to leave alone, to, to let be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part of what Smith called a natural system of liberty came to be known, came to be expressed as the doctrine of laissez-faire, which means very limited governments, etc. <clears throat> and in 1848, when Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, John Stuart Mill wrote his political economy. And he said everything should be laissez-faire unless there's a compelling interest for the government to be involved. So laissez-faire, leave alone, let be, let be was uh, a positive phrase. Mm -hmm. In 1848 Europe. Mm -hmm. And then you get the attack, many attacks on, on, on this argument. Why do we live alone? It's inefficient, it's unseemly, it's low class, whatever. And I think one of the things that happens is that you get on the American side, uh, they haven't got excellent reputations and it's too, we're in too brief a time to go into a long, but I, I recommend reading uh, Graham Sumner and, uh, and Herbert Spencer who have received, shall we say, I would think a, a, a bad rap from the progressives, but something that would help the progressives. And there's something in it, but it's not completely accurate. But let's take a point. But, um, earlier, not today, but on a previous day, uh, we talked about ABC mm -hmm. and that and that the role, what has happened, says Spencer and Sumner, is that imagine you have A person, B person, C person. And I may have the alphabet wrong here, but it's something like a B person who is educated, an administrator, who knows the public good, mm -hmm. who Adam Smith has warned us, I have never known anybody who's the intentionally public good, done the public good. B persuades or forces A, who has money, to give it to C, who doesn't have a living. And that, and that says Sumner and Spencer, essentially, is what the state has become. Mm. A redistributive society, so that A, who's the person who's <laughs> whose pocket has been picked, is is known in this story as the forgotten man. Mm -hmm. And so, what should we do? Well, we should limit the role of the state, not increase the role of the state in the. Um, so you got a certain libertarian mm -hmm. uh, coming in here. Well. What happens is that you, you, and laissez-faire now acquires for the progressives a bad terminology. It means devil take the hindmost, just read Spencer, just read Sumner. That's what it's become. And when Hoover 
is running for office in 1932 against Roosevelt, he has to defend himself and his actions that have occurred. And he's, he's been called the do-nothing president. In the midst of the Great Depression. In the midst of the Great Depression. And he, and all, but before, even before that, yes. And in 1928, when he was running, he gives this famous speech where he says, I'm not a supporter of laissez-faire. Now, does that mean he's a supporter of big government? Is he a big, huge progressive in disguise for such a... No, it means that laissez-faire has acquired a terminology which loses its cooperative character, mm -hmm. which loses its social context, mm -hmm. which loses the idea of competition and... That's, that's, they don't even talk about politics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the, the state. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that somehow um, laissez-faire has become unseemly phrase. So, so Hoover wants to disassociate, disassociate himself from laissez-faire. And people today talk about free enterprise. They hardly talk about laissez-faire anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so that word has been expunged from our lexicon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of the, of, of, of the progressive story, that to demonstrate that the market fails and the market is unseemly. And look at who's defending the market and for what reasons. Mm -hmm. So now the forgotten man under the progressives is no longer the taxpayer. The forgotten man is a down and out who's been forgotten by the few who are rich and powerful. So there's that class war that starts coming back into the picture. And Hoover's pleading cooperation. Mm -hmm. Let's have competition. There are emergencies. Let's have cooperation. We don't need to change the system. Mm -hmm. And Roosevelt comes along in his Commonwealth speech and says, the idea of equal opportunity as we know it is dead. Mm. The, the, er, the era of the uh, uh, robber baron, the era, see, we, Robert Barron, who wouldn't call himself Robert Barron, right? right. But, <laughs> the industrialists who, who have, uh, have certain philanthropic qualities to them, they <laughs> name, name the schools and buildings after themselves. That's all, all well and good. No, but that, the Robert Barons, the slaughterhouses, mm -hmm. down and out. So how dare one say that competition is, uh, is, is unseemly? Mm -hmm. So what we need is the era of the uh, independent entrepreneur, et cetera, is over, said mm. Roosevelt. The era of the enlightened administrator has arrived. Well, it's been sort of in, in the cradle for a bit, mm -hmm. from the 1880s, et right. cetera. It's been, it's, it's been there, it's, been, it's shown its influence. But the era is down, so what does that mean, planning? Because the market is, right. So do we have the, the departments? <laughs> Is this different than what Marx and socialism? Well, there's a certain difference because if you take socialism seriously, it means owning the means of production. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that, that, that we did during the Roosevelt era in terms of meeting that criteria was the uh, TVA. Mm -hmm. Everything else was regulation. Yes, Tennessee Valley Authority. But everything else was a government program, mm -hmm. a government program, a government program. It wasn't taking over a private program and make it governmental. Mm -hmm. It was, it was creating programs mm -hmm. for people. And, uh, and when you get to the LBJ, the Great Society, it's a, it's a, living the economic life is important, it's a necessary condition, but it's not great. So it's still an unseemly character to just say I'm making money off of money or I'm just engaged in commerce. Who are you? Well, I'm a lawyer, all right. I'm a, or I'm a doctor. What do you do? Well, I make money off of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So you say, hmm, yes, quite, quite, quite. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you later. <clears throat> You're not going to pick my pocket. <laughs> and, uh, so there's this idea that the enlightened administrator, through planning, will create programs which will uh, solve the temporary production problem of the Depression, because that is a production problem. Well, the same, but then we'll really get into the distribution problem. And what, and, and what the great society is about is not production. LBJ announces, we have, we have enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like Galbraith, mm -hmm. you know, that is, we have enough. But it's wrong to have two societies, as Michael Harrington said, the other America, mm -hmm. the other American. So the forgotten man now really becomes the down and out. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a and there's a, a, a civil rights component to this mm -hmm. and program great, great, new programs you 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 give new departments in the cabinet new such and such it's just not taking over the mode of production this is creating government generated production mm -hmm. that's what's different here than the, than that sort of the old fashioned nineteenth century uh, assumption that what was wrong was. If we just if we just take over what's there, things will be all right. Well, with the great society, the New Deal is to create things, right? And then I think when you get uh, and he says in this in his Michigan Great Society speech, uh, when Johnson lays this out, he says in effect, give us fifty years, mm -hmm. and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's how do you bet? Don't don't judge by just tomorrow. Right, yeah. This is going to take some time right. to develop. And then Reagan comes along. And I think the Reagan revolution is in effect to say that don't trust government. And it's interesting. Um, FDR starts off with, the, with his Constitution Day speech, and, uh, which was the uh, 150th. And he's saying the most important phrase in the Constitution is we the people. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we the people want, we the people can get, and we are constituted to do it. So heck with you, the courts. Heck with you, such and such. You give the analogy of, the, of, of, of a horse and buggy. You've got three, uh, three horses, and the American citizen is, we the people are in the chariot. Uh, well, the, the legislative horse is going this way. The executive horse is going this way. The judicial horse is going this way. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to get, get, change the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain uh, you know, uh, uh, appeal to to that. When you get to LBJ, you got not, um, it's, it's, it's not a reliance so much on we the people or mandates. It's, it's something that administrators have effectively studied and planned, and this is what we want to do. We want to create a great society. Well, why don't we the people, through what we do in the ordinary life, create a great society? What, what was wrong? So there's a somehow now, there is an a implicit, at least implicit, critique of the founding. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt didn't critique the founding in that mm -hmm. sense of progressives. He mm -hmm. just, he, he thought the Constitution could work in this age if we're, if, if we if we make it living. Right. Yeah. And Johnson didn't really concern himself mm -hmm. with, with that. Mm -hmm. And when you get to Reagan, as I said, I think he's, what he's going to say is, we the people. It's incredible. The, the, the similarity between the language of Reagan and FDR concerning the source of, of consent, we the people. And instead of saying we the people can do anything we want, mm -hmm. as long as, you know, uh, uh, Reagan is saying, we the people can tell the government what to do. So now the state has, so there's a libertarian aspect mm -hmm. has returned without its Sumner and, and, and Spencer sort of qualities. Reagan doesn't use the word laissez-faire. Right. Um, that's now gone from the lexicon, but he uses the idea that, that uh, Administrators, oh, you know what? What the words are? I'm here from the government, and I'm, I'm here, here to help. help. But run. <laughs> so the, the whole idea of the it's government failure. Mm -hmm. So there's enough evidence from 50 years after the Great Society mm -hmm. to sort of sort of demonstrate that uh, the Great that those planning programs don't work. What did the Great Society manage to achieve? And, and the subsequent little great societies, and the great society, the, the, the 50 years. Mm -hmm. What we have now is, as Reagan would say, debt. We have such and such, we have such and such. And now you sort of you create a sort of a, a conservative revolution, which is not so much an attempt to shut down government or make the idea that the state is always wrong, but rather to rearrange the sense of dependency, mm -hmm. to go back to the idea of self-reliance. and. And the city upon a hill. There's something good about America which attracts people. What is it? Mm -hmm. The chance for equal opportunity. So Reagan is saying equal opportunity as we know it can be revived. We have a new frontier. We mm -hmm. have a new such and such. So there's a bringing of hope. And if you say, well, how do I measure the Reagan revolution in terms of the, the budget deficit, this, that, and the other. I don't. I mean, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are ten percent, eleven percent, twelve percent. That's not bad. But I think the Reagan Revolution is a 
is, um, is, is reminding Americans of, of hope. Mm. And, and the idea of, uh, of self-reliance mm. and trust your own judgment and common sense. And so he was really going, I think, after the enlightened administrator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, and that, so now where are we? Well, the enlightened administrator is back. Yeah. Uh, and we had a four years of, of say, I don't know, I'm not even going to get into that. I'm just going to say that I know that the enlightened administrator is back. And we, we just have to wait and see where we go. And has Reagan's revolution st um, stuck or have we abandoned that? That, um, that, that, I think that's for the Republican Party to decide. That's for the American people to decide how much that, that goes on and, and whether the founders would recognize. But the real issue now as we close to bring this together, it seems that what Reagan did was to bring the founders back into the picture. Mm -hmm. So that it's founders versus progressives. Mm -hmm. And he, he started with the progressives versus the founders. Yes. And, he and now it's not the founders versus the progressives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part, part of the way to end this story. And the story continues. It does. Well, Dr. Lloyd, we covered a lot of ground here in this fourth and final session. I want to thank you so much for uh, your incredible wisdom and uh, experience in writing about these issues and discussing these issues. I know we've all learned a lot from it. And I want to thank you all for joining us for these four sessions. As we've said from the very beginning, this is intended to be a conversation. And while we've had a conversation between these great thinkers and a conversation, obviously, between ourselves, we hope this promotes a conversation with you, uh, one that we hope continues and hope to also continue to host uh, in upcoming video series that we plan here at Pepperdine and the Graduate School of Public Policy. From our founding over 20 years ago, we've always believed that the formation of public leaders has to begin with a conversation, has to begin with the ability to not only understand how you think, but understand how the other side thinks in the formation of public policy that supports the common good. I invite you to find out more about Pepperdine and our School of Public Policy at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. And with that, Dr. Lloyd, thank you very much for your time with us.